Peak Builders, Evan Montgomery here. I'm coming at you again from the studio today, and we have a very special guest today, Chris Cat from Aquatic Art, who's uh, been featured in a few of the videos in the past here on Reef Builders. Um, we're gonna do kind of a tag team effort on some of the uh, more tedious maintenance that we have to do here at the studio. Um, so I figured I'd invite Chris over for some help. Today, we are going to be tackling some Acropora eating flatworms. Uh, we're standing here next to our uh, main Acropora coral flat, and not every single acro in here is infested, but it's been a little while since we've given these corals a good dip, so um, the acro eating flatworms have had a chance to spread a little bit more than desired. In one of our more recent videos, uh, I told you guys how we deal with Montsipora eating nudibranchs here, and Acropora eating flatworms are similar to those nudibranchs in that they can be kind of tricky to spot with the naked eye, and getting the adults off is relatively easy, especially if you have a coral dip. Um, the eggs are the problem. And we just looked it up, Chris, what was the um, time that an adult takes? It was two or three weeks before uh, an egg hatches before that uh, adult can... Yeah, between the time they hatch to when they can lay eggs again is about two to three weeks. Um, I've heard sometimes up to four weeks, but that's what we kind of just shoot for is two to three weeks. Um, and so it's a pretty quick life cycle, but at least there's an idea of Okay, we have a timeline, which um, gives everybody a chance to get some kind of a game plan of how they're gonna tackle them if they ever get them. We, we wanted to talk about what to do once you get them in your tank, and then more importantly, how to prevent them if, if there's a possibility as you're, we're trading corals and getting new stuff in, and how do we get prevent? Because once you get them, they suck, um, and it's hard to get rid of, and it's, um, it takes a lot of time and effort. So I think between the two, but two to three weeks gives us a timeline, then we can start. Yeah, so similar to the nudibranchs, I guess uh, if you can actually take the coral out of the tank to dip it, then this is a whole different game versus if you have a display tank and you're trying to battle them in place. You know, I've seen people try to spray RO water on them to knock them off so that the fish can eat them. Um, I've seen people do all kinds of crazy things. Biological control is pretty hit or miss. Um, some people swear by peppermint shrimp for them. Some people talk about different file fish, um, wrasses possibly, but those are all about 50-50, you know, take, take your chances. Um, they really are, like Chris said, pretty difficult to get rid of. Pray to the reef gods. Yeah. <laughs> um, that is always something that I've done numerous times. Too. Pray, quarantine, you know, yeah. hedge, hedge your bets. <laughs> all of the above, I think. All of the above, yeah, the exactly. Um, kitchen sink it. Yeah, you know, usually when you're looking at um, your tank, especially if it's a, um, you can't physically go in and, and inspect the coral like we can in these flats, it, you can tell because the, co the color of the acro is just not the same. Something's off with that thing. And it used to be really good. And so, um, you know, a lot of people will go in there and I've removed rocks out of, you know, thousand gallon tanks because, you know, that acro doesn't look good. And so then, then at least you can get your hands on it. But every two or three weeks, um, some kind of inter intervention is what we recommend that you, you try and do. And if you have a small frag, or even if it's like several small frags without a whole lot of nooks and crannies, then this becomes a whole lot easier. You can get the adults and you can also probably see all the eggs. If you have larger colonies like we do here, um, I hate to say it, but it's gonna be really, really challenging to get all the eggs over time. So your best option is to clip off whatever's healthy and then kind of uh, send the rest, you know, pour that one out for the homies. Depending on the situation, you may end up losing some coral, but you can stay ahead of it. And uh, there is usually some part of the coral that's uninfected that you could turn into a frag, which would then be easy to kind of keep a closer eye on. We do the same th themes with RTN. I mean, you, you go to work and the coral's great and you come back and it's half gone. And so we yeah. get in there and start clipping it because we want to save the DNA. Save what you can if possible, absolutely. Any SPS keeper knows that RTN is the way it goes. And so these can be just as deadly, but not as quick as something like that. So it's the plight of an SPS reef keeper that you're going to have a lot of these other things. And if you just had green star polyps, then you'd be fine. You yeah, wouldn't exactly. have to deal with it. But yeah. that's why we enjoy, we like the challenge of this. But these will test your, your um, patience and, and challenge you with uh, trying to eradicate. That certainly is proving to be the case here. Uh, so without further ado, um, we've got a little uh, cart that we set up as kind of a dipping station. So we'll go grab that and roll it over here and uh, kind of show you how we deal with Acropora eating flatworms. 
For this particular round today, we're gonna to use Revive by Two Little Fishies. It's worked quite well for us in the past uh, for getting Acropora eating flatworms off. So we've put in the appropriate amount already here. We have a standard five gallon tank. I put 14 liters of water in here so it's not quite full. We have a small uh, kind of a power filter just to move some water. It has a small sponge in there. So every two or three rounds of acros that we dip, uh, we'll go ahead and take that filter apart and just rinse the sponge out. And you'd actually be really surprised how much coral slime, um, amphipods, cyanobacteria, and Montipor or, uh, Acropora eating flatworms that we'll find in that sponge. So having a little sponge in there to keep the water moving while you're not basting is important and it also can help catch a little bit of that extra, extra funk that gets kicked up. Uh, we have a small bucket here that we use for rinsing the corals after we dip them before we put them back in the tank. We'll just kind of swish them around in there. Uh, we have our rinse bottles here. So in case we have a larger coral that won't fit in this dip bucket, we can just put it over a tray and kind of spray it off. You know, uh, this system is 600 gallons. So if we don't get every last bit of the dip off, it's not gonna be the end of the world. But if you had a smaller tank, maybe a Nano or something like that, you'd really wanna make sure to rinse all the dip off your corals before you put it back in the tank just to avoid uh, any issues with that. We have a couple random containers to kind of uh, scrape off cyano and uh, just, you know, as long as we're cleaning up the corals, if we see any bubble algae or something like that, as long as we have it out of the tank, this is a good opportunity to uh, clean all that up as well. So a few extra little containers around so that you can uh, clean things up without contaminating your dip tank too much is always a good idea. Um, of course, a turkey baster to actually blow the flatworms off and uh, kind of keep things moving in the dip. Um, a little brush we have here, uh, the battle brush from Battle Corals is really helpful to uh, sometimes scrape the eggs off, as well as a couple picks to, uh, you know, again, just to kind of scrape eggs off with the dental tools here. Um, we have a timer in a plastic bag so it doesn't get wet. Obviously you could use your phone, but we have a standalone timer, so that's what we use for that. Um, a fish net with small holes in it comes in really useful in between batches of acros. If you have you know, enough acros to where you're doing multiple batches, you can take this in there and actually get out a lot of the coral slime and flatworms that the filter didn't suck up. And worst case scenario, a pair of bone cutters never hurts in case there's something that just has so many acro, you know, you can see so many eggs on it, you know you're never gonna get them all. Sometimes the sacrifice is the best way to go. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to add to that? Is this kind of the same way that you guys do it down at Aquatic Art or? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really good that, you know, um, having the net, cause sometimes when you dip a bunch of them, you don't know if the, it's infected. So having and removing them all, so then when you put a new coral in and you don't have any um, flatworms on, then you know that that one's not effect, infected or uh, inf infested <laughs> with acros uh, or with flatworms. So d removing them all is, is a good way to yeah. be able to tell like a fresh batch every single time to see how many come off or if any come off at all. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, for that reason, so that you know, A, if it's infested or not, and then also so that the acro so that the flatworms you just got off the last batch don't somehow get yeah. onto corals that were clean to begin with. Yeah. So getting good. Here's my new ride. Here's my ride out of here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, having the net's good. And I love dental picks. I mean, they are so useful for bubble algae, scraping um, eggs off. I mean, I, this is one of my favorite tools of all time with aquariums. Um, is So to have those handy and you can get precise and get in there is, is a great one. But everything else is perfect. I mean, we're all ready to get a bunch of these jerks off these corals. Exactly. Well, we pulled one of these acro colonies out. And so when we inspect it, you can, we can see the worms on there. Um, they blend in surprisingly well um, when you're looking from far through your tank. But we, we pulled it out, found that we had some worms on them. And then what we found is that we found a, a big patch of eggs. And so they don't lay the eggs on the coral tissue but they're not gonna go far from their food source, which is the coral tissue, to lay their eggs. So it's gonna be right on the edge of where the living coral tissue is and the dead coral tissue or the rock or the frag flat or frag plug or whatever it is. And so when you look real close um, on this one, we have it under the microscope and you can see the, the eggs that are on there. They're lightly brown in color. Um, and um, if you look on the, the base of that acro, you can see a bunch of, a big patch of them. Surprisingly, 
they don't blow off with a turkey baster. Um, in fact, you could probably have a tsunami and they wouldn't come off because they're attached really well to that base. Um, and so we go through, um, once we, we dip this coral and go through uh, getting all the worms off, then we'll either make the, the distinction to cut that coral completely off and get back to living tissue so we know that there's no dead tissue around it to start fresh, or we'll use one of our scrapers which um, and scrape those eggs off. Obviously, you wouldn't want to do it over your frag tank or your tank because they're going to go in, hatch, and then re-infest. So we want to do it when it's outside the tank. With the number of corals we have, um, it would take a really long time to dip them one by one. So we usually do them three or four at a time, depending on the exact size of the coral. So here we have some that have really been looking pale recently. Then we're uh, pretty sure every single one of these is highly infested. Obviously, based on what you just saw under the microscope, at least one of them is. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just plop them into the dip here. And then go ahead and start the timer. We just do five minutes for, for a flatworm dip. And then I'll give them a little light basting here just to kind of get the dip down into the nooks and crannies. And already I'm seeing uh, <laughs> quite a few. Yes, we found ground zero, I think. Yeah, one of several ground zeros probably, but I see some very, uh, very respectably sized uh, flatworms in there. Um, another thing I should mention, is it's important to have a good light over your dip tank so that you can actually see what you're getting off. Uh, we use one of our studio lights here a lot of times. Uh, these are made by Philex. They're kind of a, a sister company to Kessel and they make some great lights that we use for filming mostly. Um, and it doesn't really matter the color spectrum. You know, I have this set to a wider spectrum right now, but you know, any old lamp from Home Depot, any kind of spotlight should do. Um, and I'll go in, you know, about once a minute and give them another baste. And then right as the dip is ending up, uh, finishing up, I'll really, really give them a good flush, actually turn them over, give the base a, a good baste. That's hard to say. Um, so yeah, it's been about uh, almost a minute here. So I'll give them another, another baste and, and really get down in the, uh, in between the branches is where they like to hide out. What were you gonna say? And if you don't have a, a small tank like this, um, I really like using white buckets. Um, when we go through dip because you can see the contrast of any kind of worm or maybe there's something else on your acros or any other coral for that matter, but they'll land in the bottom of the bucket and you can kind of see what's been going on with your coral. So the white bucket is real good. If you have a tank like this, you can put a, um, a piece of white paper underneath or a styrofoam box lid um, and do it on top and gives you a little bit better of an idea of what's coming off the corals. Absolutely, yeah, if you don't have a tank, you could use a five gallon bucket or a just a white tray of yeah. some kind and you know pretty much anything that the coral will fit in so or a smaller size if you're just doing a couple corals small buckets are great for yeah. so many things and you don't go through so much dip that no yeah that's the case Julian too. would love it for us to do a <laughs> bucket, but he sure would and also well, yeah. um you know other acros just, deep water acros don't like dipping that much at all so um, usually with deep waters, uh, something that's gonna be a real smooth skin, um, uh, thin branches, I'll only do about three uh, minutes on the, in the dip and I'll be maybe a little less aggressive um, with the, the um, turkey baster because I don't wanna really, the, they're so delicate as it is that I don't wanna kind of just blow that tissue right off. Um, but luckily, um, in my experience, deep water acros aren't as affected by acro-eating flatworms as some of the other species. In general, I'd agree. Yeah, in yeah. general. Yeah. Um, any acro can get them, but when you have, you know, some are tastier to these devil spawn than others are. So, um, so that's kind of a, a blessing in disguise. Yeah, and I think on most uh, coral dips, it says you can go up to 15 minutes. We've never found going past five for flatworms to really be there's no point in going past about five minutes with any coral. And then like Chris said, for the deep waters, three is more usually more than enough. Yeah, especially with agitation, because if, you, if you're if you agitating, they're stressed out as soon as they hit the dip. And then when you agitate the water pump, uh, turkey baster, then they're gonna fall off. And that's what we're really looking for. For some of our larger corals too, that we couldn't get off a rock. So we would really have to set up a massive amount of dip. Um, we just skipped the dip altogether and just took it over. The two of us held it above the sink 
and with one of these kind of spray bottles, just sprayed down the entire underside of this. This was a leather coral in this case, not an Acropora. Um, but we got 95% of them with no dip required. Just the pressure, you know, just simply by spraying them off, they, they come right off quite easily. All right, five minutes is up. Um, I'll just give them one more good base, like I was saying. Cause some, some of the uh, larger worms don't actually want to let go until till last minute here. Okay, and then as I take them out, um, obviously with smaller corals, this works a lot better. <laughs> you can do this easier than with a large colony, but I'll just kind of swish it around on the top to knock off any more loose flatworms or ones that were already knocked off, but landed on there again. And then I'll do the same in the rinse water. Put them back on the tray and get them back in place. There's a good one. Um, there's a couple of good ones there. Um, the good part about having this filter is that most of them have already been sucked in there, so there's not a whole lot left just floating around, but um, definitely some uh, very mature old um, flatworms on there, and I'm sure those corals are feeling a heck of a lot better. Another little trick that I'd like to show you, especially if you have a, a frag table or a larger tank with a lot of corals, um, just to keep track, I'll uh, take a picture of the tank beforehand and put it on my laptop over here. And as we go, um, there's the four corals that we just dipped. So those had flatworms on them, quite a few. So I'll go ahead and circle those in red. If a coral only has a couple flatworms, I'll circle it in yellow. And if a coral is completely clean, I'll circle it with green. Uh, this not only lets me help kind of keep track of um, which corals are infected, but it also helps me keep track of which corals I've done. Uh, you know, especially if I'm doing this by myself, it takes more than one day oftentimes to get all the corals dipped. So just to keep track of which ones I've done already and which ones I haven't, uh, taking a picture is, uh, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words and it's, uh, it's quite valuable in this case as well, just to kind of keep track of things. So um, we're gonna keep making our way through some of the smaller ones for now. And then uh, we're gonna move on to some of the larger colonies and show you how we deal with that. Okay, so we found a piece over here of this one acro and it's got quite a bit of damage on it. You can see there pretty much the entire base, this is all dead. And then starting about where my finger is up on that branch, uh, up on upwards on that branch, that's about all that's still good on this. So I think so, uh, I'm gonna let Chris do the honors. So as we go through, you know, we're, we're trying to avoid it because they lay the eggs on any exposed skeleton. So we, we really don't wanna leave that much or we wanna scrape it. So as we look at this coral, we're, we're going, okay, well, you know, about right here is where we're gonna have um, good living tissue and then we can discard the rest of this and then we won't have to worry about any of that or any of the eggs that are on there because there are no eggs on there. Then we'll glue it, we'll dip it, and then we'll know that that one's free of any worms and free of any eggs. So I'll just cut that. Whoops. I ended up with a couple. <laughs> Got a couple of frags. Um, uh, and so we'll, Evan's yeah. gonna take that. We'll go and ahead and glue this to a tile. Glue it to a tile, and I think we can take these two little other tips. Cool. And then we'll put that, and then once Evan um, mounts them onto a uh, frag, uh, uh, frag pl plug or um, anything, a piece of rock or whatever, then um, this whole piece that has you can, we can see eggs in there. We have exposed tissue um, and some flatworms on it. We're just gonna discard this. Um, we still have the genealogy of the coral. Um, now we know it's clean. Um, and so we can kind of put it back and regrow that at that time. It's also very common for people when they get new acros, whether it's a um, from an online vendor or your local fish store or even trading with another hobbyist, um, is that when they'll get it in, um, they'll cut it off the frag plug. I think we mentioned it earlier, but it's the, really the easiest way um, if you're gonna put it in a quarantine tank before it goes into your main system, but it's the easiest way to um, eliminate the eggs. The worms are bad but the eggs are even worse because they go through any dip um, and then you have two to three weeks before they hatch and then you have a thousand or 
however many come out, um, not a thousand, but it depends on how many flatworms you have, but you'll have a ton out there. So to get the eggs away so um, is the best thing that you can do. So cutting it off, whatever it came on, remounting it, inspecting, dipping, and remounting it, um, you'll know that that uh, frag plug or the rock that it came in is not going to be the cause of the um, infestation in, in any system you're going to put them in. So we got the coral mounted, um, the one that we had before, and we got it mounted onto a frag disc. So before I go, because I'm going to do another round of I'm going to go through and I'm going to try and get as much of the stuff out because I really want to see if these things are um, infected like the other ones were. And if there's a bunch of dead worms in there, then I'm not going to be able to get them all. It'll give us a better chance. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put that one in. And since we have a couple other ones real close to us, we're going to go ahead and take this one. And we'll put him through a round of dips yeah, so we get that one's been hurting for a while. Yeah, and then I think this one was the one you said. Yeah, it? that one okay. also has been looking pretty suspect. And so we'll put those in, and, and then we'll start, start the, timer. the timer. Yep. And so we got our five minutes. Five minutes in counting. Perfect. And then we'll let the dip and the agitation do its job, but I'll certainly help it out with a little bit of short blasts to try and really um, dislodge the worms and get them out into the dip. It, it's really a sucky thing that we have to deal with as Aquarius, but they're really cool creatures when you, you take a step back and how they can slime, how they um, live on acros, um, the, the life cycle, everything is, is, it's a really cool creature. It's just not cool for us. Um, and how they evolve to, to live off acros is, is pretty fascinating. But um, we want to try and really get them off by um, a lot of agitation and, and they can really stick on really quite well at, at times. Um, so hitting it with the turkey baser at different angles um, really helps at times, uh, especially if you have a big co or a colony like this where they can be wedged in between branches. Um, and so the different angles can really help out a lot too. And this particular colony also has a bunch of bubble algae in here in between the branches. So um, I'm not trying to spend all day and get 100% of it, but just by using the dental pick, you know, some big chunks of uh, bubble algae are coming out and it's not exactly the goal of today's project is to uh, get algae, but as long as I have the coral out of the tank and the dental tool right here, you know, it's worth spending uh, 30 seconds to a minute to just get in here and get some of the big chunks because that'll really allow the flow to open back up and get, uh, get the coral happier again, being able to breathe again. And then there's a bit of detritus along the base. Um, you know, I'll just kind of go ahead and, you know, I'm not trying to make it sterile by any means. I'm just trying to get the big chunks off. Um, so, yep, that one's looking pretty good now. So go ahead and put that in the dip. You can see some of the real massive guys that have uh, kind of reattached to the bottom of the tank. Um, this is basically a snow globe of flatworms at this point. So huge thanks to Chris Cap for coming by this afternoon, giving us a couple hours of his time. Uh, he's a really busy guy. He runs aquatic art down in Highlands Ranch. Uh, if you've never visited that store and you're anywhere close by the Denver area, I highly recommend you go check it out. Um, but he's a busy guy, so he had to get going for the afternoon. Uh, we did a few more rounds of dipping kind of the small corals here before he left and uh, I'll be taking it solo from here. Um, pretty much what we've showed you up until this point, uh, if you've ever dipped a coral before, this is probably very familiar, uh, maybe on a slightly larger scale where we've been kind of dipping mini colonies more than frags in this video. Um, in some of our other coral flats where we also have issues with pests, uh, including flatworms, um, where we have frags, we've actually cut egg crate frag racks to be the exact size of the five gallon tank that we use for dipping. So that way we can get 20 or 30 frags dipped and you know basted and cleaned all at once. It's a whole lot quicker than going coral by coral, you know, three or four corals at a time, fitting them in here, which is what you have to do with the larger stuff. But if you have a bunch of frags and you have uh, issues with flatworms, you know, make a frag rack the size of your five gallon bucket or your five gallon tank, your 10 gallon tank, whatever you're dipping in and uh, you know, save a whole lot of time by dipping multiple corals at once. You're probably wondering what we do for some of our larger corals. 
because that's not quite as obvious. It's not just quite your simple uh, dipping. Um, we do something slightly different. I'm gonna go ahead and transfer the dip water from this tank to this tank. We still have the small power filter with the sponge in it, which I just cleaned out as well. It was getting quite disgusting, even just after uh, a couple of rounds of dipping. Um, so we have, uh, for all intents and purposes, pretty much cleaned up dip. And we have a normal maxi jet pump here with a hose attached to it, um, with a little kind of spray nozzle on the end there that uh, helps increase the pressure just a little bit. And this is what we're gonna use to dip some of our larger colonies. I just pulled out, I think, uh, one of the largest colonies that we have in the coral flats. Um, this is also one that has been quite suspect in the past. Um, I can already see a couple bite marks around the base here. Um, I can't say I see any eggs, but uh, I'm sure they're in there somewhere. So um, this coral obviously is not gonna be completely submerged in the amount of water that I have in this tank but we'll carefully maneuver the branches around the corners. And yep, this coral just barely fits in there. I have a feeling next time we do this, we might need a larger tank. We'll get this tray out of the way. And then the part of the coral that's submerged, you basically do the same thing with the turkey baster that we did on the old, uh, other part. But instead of using tons and tons of dip to fill this up so that the coral can be completely submerged, that is where the maxi jet with the hose comes in. Even a, even a maxi jet provides quite a lot of flow, so I'll kind of uh, go ahead and kink the hose with my other hand, so that, uh, just to slow the flow down a little bit. And then we just give the entire coral, all the branches that are out of the water, just give them a nice shower. This obviously might not be quite as effective as the uh, full submersion technique where the branches are fully submerged for the full five minutes, um, but this should give the flatworms enough exposure to the, to the dip over time to where they, uh, they should just come off. Something I should note if you're dipping acros, um, try to do the uh, staghorns, the uh, green slimer type corals last. They do tend to, as you can see here, they, they throw off quite a bit of mucus when you uh, put them in a dip like this. And that can uh, just kind of foul up the dip. I see a couple flatworms, but surprisingly, it's not as bad as I was expecting it to, uh, to be. This coral has been looking a little pale recently and it's definitely been a, a prime suspect in the past. So I was, uh, I was thinking there'd be a few more flatworms, but I'm only seeing a couple small ones for now. So this one really wasn't as bad as I was expecting, but you know, that's part of the reason that you have to go through the process of dipping is because you never really know until you know. So um, at this point, this is another, uh, this is one of the these big corals that I can't just uh, throw in a small bucket of rinse water. And then yeah, this uh, wash bottle here is real good to just get the dip off. And this will also knock off any uh, last minute flatworms. Just really rinse it off, especially uh, where the branches separate, flatworms hang out. Just try to get all that dip off of there. For us, this is probably a coral that we're gonna end up cutting a few of the healthy tips off of and sacrificing the rest. As painful as that is to do a lot of times, um, there are a lot of instances where that really is the best option. And I think for a lot of our corals, our, our larger colonies in here, that's kind of what we're gonna end up doing. Um, we'll save as much of the healthy stuff as we can, but then once we get those corals back onto uh, a more manageable size, we can put frags on frag plugs. And like I was saying earlier, we can kind of dip 20 at a time that way, instead of one large colony at a time. You know, if you do this a handful of times with a large colony and you're still battling it, it's still not looking better, you're still finding eggs, et cetera, et cetera, um, then yeah, really the best thing you can do is probably just to uh, save what you can and sacrifice the rest. Just like for the new to Brank video, I'm sure you guys were uh, really hoping that I just had a bottle of magic potion that you could dump in your tank and kill all the flatworms. Uh, it's really hard to avoid flatworms, kind of like any pest. You know, if you acquire corals as often as we do, um, 
it's really difficult to get them through quarantine with the life cycles of the eggs hatching and all that. It can take quite a while. Safest, if you do get new corals, to always cut the bases off. Just keep the tips. Sure, hope you guys have enjoyed uh, another kind of version of uh, seeing what I do here for maintenance at the studio, a little bit more behind the scenes, kind of uh, what goes on to keep these corals happy and healthy. The, uh, the overall point is to uh, not freak out about it, Tests are gonna happen um, and just try to stay ahead of it as you can. You don't have to overthink it and tear your whole tank apart. Um, just get a bucket with some dip and a turkey baster and uh, you can definitely buy yourself some time. Um, and again, huge thanks to Chris Cap for coming over this afternoon um, and giving us his time to help me with this video and uh, help me get ahead of uh, one of the most problematic plagues that we've ever faced here at the studio. We're only about 80 days away from reef stock in Denver. So if you are anywhere within driving distance or flying distance, I highly encourage you to come out. Uh, we have a heck of a good show planned this year. We got some great speakers, great vendors. Um, the after hours activities are always pretty fun. And uh, it's just overall a really good chance to meet fellow hobbyists and learn quite a bit about this hobby that we all share together. So um, I hope you can make it out March 4th and 5th in Denver, Colorado. Visit reefstock.show for more information. Tickets are on sale now, so I hope to see you there. We're also getting reef therapy back online. Um, I did an episode with Jeremy uh, a week or so ago, and uh, he just recorded another episode that should be released shortly. So if you're a fan of reef therapy, keep your eyes and ears tuned into that, and I'll talk to you guys on the next video very soon. Later.